Jack them up, boys. Hey, it's good to have y'all. Welcome to Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus, King of the Cowboys, and everybody's welcome. The reason we say that is because we want you to know that God is no respecter of persons. And we are glad that you are here today. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, when we receive the word, it's Jesus called it the washing of the water of the word. Uh, Paul also later on talked about the washing of the water of the word. I want you to receive the word today and to be able to put it into your life and and make use of it. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That rightly dividing the word of truth means where you apply it to your life. I want you to receive the word today, be able to apply it to your life, and remember that God loves you. I'll talk to you after this broadcast. You know, I want to read something this morning. And, and as we talk about communion today and, and how communion goes, uh, you know, a lot of times we read the Last Supper. Uh, we read uh, what it says in Corinthians. But this morning this stood out to me. Um, as I was thinking about communion today. If I can put that down without spilling it. Um, first, we do this because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And when you read, and that, if you don't know this, Matthew, Mark, and John were all written in Hebrew. And when you look at the Hebrew, what he actually said is, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of what I've done for you. So there's some things that communion means. Communion means fellowship. Uh, so what we're doing really is having fellowship with what he's done for us. I listened to uh, uh, some Sunday morning, uh, the Bluegrass Station plays gospel music. And the last song before I walked in here today was uh, God's Not Dead. What we have to remember is God's not dead. He said, I talked to, the, you know, that starts, it says, I talked to him this morning. God's not dead. Uh, he healed my body. God's not dead. And we think about those things that, that uh, he's done and, and the things that he's done for us. And, and I think Richard's watching from the, uh, hospital this morning. If you don't know, Richard's in uh, back in a hospital right now um, with some infection they're they're working on. Uh, great spirits. I, I was with him last night, prayed with him, and and uh, we had a we had a good good visit. Um, and he told me this. He told me. He says, "I know that God is taking care of me," and that's the thing that we've got to realize is is God's got us. Even when the challenge looks like it's coming, this is why we have communion. This is why we have fellowship with what he's done is so that we remember, hey, when the challenge comes, I know the answer. The answer was taken care of at Calvary. I, this is what, I, what really stood out to me today um, as I was preparing for this is uh, Matthew and, or no, I'm sorry, it's Luke. Uh, chapter 11 and it's about being a lamp of the body it says Jesus said this in uh, uh, Matthew eleven thirty three. he said no one when he has lit a lamp puts it in a secret place under a basket but he puts it on a lampstand that those who come in may see in the light the lamp is the body Excuse me. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when the eye is good, the whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Then your whole body will be full of light 
having no part of dark. The whole body will be full of light. And when the bright shining of a lamp gives you that light. And I feel like the reason that that stood out to me is because I believe the communion time is, is the time of that shining of the lamp to us, to remember those things that God's done for us. And, and uh, I think somebody just came in, but I was going to give them a chance to get in and, and get communion, but we'll just go on. Um, is there somebody coming in? Okay. Father, we thank you right now for the opportunity that you give us to remember that by your stripes we were healed. So as we take this representation of your body this morning, Father, I thank you for all the blessings that you've given us through what you went through at the cross. And Father, as we take the grape juice this morning, which is the representation of the blood that you shed for remission of sins, and we know that that means full payment as if it never happened. Father, thank you for that promise to us. Thank you for all you've done, and thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's eat it and drink it together. I think I'd like to uh, also share about, you know, for uh, not only for our visitors, but for everybody that, that has come uh, later after I've talked about this. We, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have a uh, nursery, and the reason we don't have a nursery is we uh, have always had the kitty corral. And the, idea in the kitty corral um, was I remember when we were in the tent and we didn't have the ability to have a, a child, uh, we, we had children's church but we didn't have a nursery we had the kitty corral in the back for those that were here um, and I remember and it was, it was a Peyton, Peyton Spangler um, she would, she couldn't even stand up. But I looked back one day and she pulled herself up on the rail and she was worshiping like her parents worshiped. And I thought, that's the way our children should grow up, is it, having the ability to be able to uh, learn to worship. And she was uh, actually probably not much bigger than y'all's baby. And she pulled herself up back there and was, was just raising her hand. And it, it just blessed me to see how we uh, bring our children up in that, in that way. <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, do, do, do we get that up, Lori? Okay. Hey, let's play this video real quick before we, uh, we go on. I was in the school the other day and just before we get started today I um, In our school, Faith Academy, um, the teachers take turns leading at lunchtime, I guess, for the prayer. And one of our uh, uh, relatively new teachers uh, led the prayer, and I, I, it made me think, let's, we should, uh, let's stand and say this, or fold, let's fold our hands and say this together. Um, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I messed it up already. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God, God is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
You have to read it out of Matthew to, to not mess it up. I read it out of Luke, okay? Each one of them is a little bit different. Um, take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. We live in a society today where I believe that we can uh, become desensitized to what I want to talk about this morning. I want to talk about the Good Samaritan this morning. And I don't know that you know, we can look at the, the third chapter of, of Acts and, and realize that there was a guy begging, and then you can look at blind Bartimaeus, and there was a guy begging. Um, e- each one of them had some kind of physical challenge in, that, in those places, the examples that we have. But because we live in a society today that... Um, Pretty much there's somebody on every corner um, and in some places. Um, I think about from time to time uh, our, our children's minister, she has had the vision to uh, uh, do backpacks and we all have taken those backpacks and, and uh, uh, given them to different people that were in need. Uh, the backpack always had uh, uh, some food in it, you know, whether it was food bars or whatever it was. Uh, we learned a long time ago, Kathleen and I, not to give uh, cans that you had to have an opener for. Because one day we handed one out of our uh, motor home we were living in, and a guy came back and said, I don't have a can opener. <laughs> um, so, and it's cool because now even if you have cans in there, they got pull tops on them. Um, there's a hand warmer in it, you know, those kind that you can break and stick in your pockets and socks and different things. Uh, and something I, th- I thought about that is, are we really in need or are we just begging? And that's the reason that I think sometimes we, come de- it, we become desensitized. I remember one time Scott and I were in, uh, we'd been to Angola and done an outreach with uh, Dove Morgan and, and, and that ministry uh, in that prison. And, we, and Scott and I were coming back that afternoon, and we uh, drove out of a, a Walmart. And, and it was somewhere in Louisiana that, that we did this, or East Texas, one or the other. Anyway, when we came out, um, there was a guy there, and he was begging. Whatever his sign said, I don't remember. And Scott reached over, and he got the backpack, and he handed it out the window to him. He says, no, I don't need a backpack. I already got one. You've experienced that too. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I think sometimes people don't realize what you're trying to give them. And we might do it with the right heart, but yet, and, and Kathleen and I, one time we were in uh, Las Vegas, and that particular year, I remember it, at National Files Rodeo, it had snowed, and there was a girl sitting on, the, on an on-ramp. Now, this is, all pertains to what we're going to look at this morning. <clears throat> and this girl had her, she was covered up with a blanket. Um, when she got up to get the backpack, we discovered she didn't even have any socks on. And so she sat right down and put the socks on out of the, out of the pack. And before we ever left the light, she had a food bar and eaten it. And, and so, you know, the other side of it, there's always uh, tracks in that stuff. So they have the opportunity to be introduced to Jesus Christ. Um, but... I believe this. If you're not willing to take care of somebody, don't try to preach to them. I'm not one of those guys that will hand a tract to somebody if I, if I don't bless them first. Um, 
I, uh, you know, we just came back from the uh, outreach at Galveston, and um, we had uh, sat and ate lunch. And the guy that had served us, um, I do know that he received about $25 in tips from five of us. Um, and that was just because everybody just blessed him. And that opened the door for the opportunity that I looked at him and I said, if you died tonight or next year or 30 years from now, do you know where you would go? And he said, pretty sure I'm going to hell. Uh, he says, I've done some pretty rough things. I used to live in Chicago. Um, I don't know what that had to do with it, but doing rough things, we can live anywhere and do that. And, and uh, I asked him, I said, would you like to know where you're going to go? And he said, I would. And he sat down there in the chair and he received Jesus. And I, I handed him, a, you know, we have a, a little cross that we give so that he would remember this day. And, but I waited until he had been well blessed before I tried to, to share with him. And so I'm, I'm telling you there's things that we should do. And, and that's why I want to look at this uh, uh, parable that, that Jesus told about uh, the Samaritan. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in verse 30. So this is chapter 10, verse 30 of Luke. This happens to be the only book in the Gospels that was originally written in Greek because Luke was a, a, uh, a Greek. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, and they stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, the place where, and, and we've been there uh, before, I, I, and, I, and I don't remember if, were, have you been, I don't remember if you were with us when we went to that place or not where this path was. You don't know, okay. Um, I've been to the place where the, the Good Samaritan uh, came, and that's what we're reading this morning. And So I want to I tell you what the terrain looked like first. Because when you look at this, it looks like it's just a path that's flat and they could just cross over to one side. In order to cross over to the other side of the path, you literally had to go down through the valley and back up on the hill on the other side. So to, go, to not walk by this guy, you had to decide, I am not going to help that guy. And this is something that we realize that, uh, that as we read things... If we don't really know what the topography is or uh, what the uh, terrain looks like, then it looks a whole lot different to us, like it could be just an easy thing to decide you're not going to help somebody. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite arrived at the, at the place and came and looked and passed by on the other side. So they literally had to make a decision. And now, now I, I feel like this. If you don't know, uh, of course, I, I feel like the priest should have helped him. Um, otherwise, what are we doing? Are we really representing the God that we serve, or are we, because we're, we're talking about, about, a, about a guy that was beat up by thieves. Now, if I'm afraid of the thieves, I probably wouldn't be on the road the first place because this place is, uh, it, it literally is almost straight up like this with a valley down the middle, and you'd think the, the valley would be the, the automatic place for the path. Uh, because that would be the easiest place. But it wasn't because that could be the easiest place to get mugged, and which is literally what this guy did. 
then again, the Levite, you know, um, the, the Levite is, is, is another representation of the, uh, the priests uh, in the, the, the Levitical uh, tribe. Um, they had a certain standard they were supposed to live by. And yet he didn't bother to help this guy at all. Now, a certain Samaritan, if you don't know what Samaritan means, it actually means foreigner. Um, in Israel, even today, uh, if you live in Samaria and you're a Samaritan, the Jews don't have anything to do with them, and the Samaritans don't have anything to do with the Jews. Uh, the, even though they live in the same place, they believe in the same God, they all believe that they, they're supposed to worship where they worship. Um, the Samaritans are very uh, love God. They just think they're supposed to worship Him there in Samaria. And when we, we were there, um, it stood out because they still do their uh, sacrifices and the Day of Atonement and everything right there. And, and Kathleen and I went through those places. So as I, the reason I'm sharing that is because it's important for us to realize this wasn't just somebody that came along. He loved God just as much as the priest and the Levite did. Uh, but he was different in what he did. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Now you think about this. You think about a guy that was going from Jerusalem to Jericho was a Jew. He was, and so the Jews ridiculed the Samaritans. They literally, you, you don't know where you're supposed to worship. You don't know what you're supposed to do. Um, and they didn't just call them Samaritans. They called them foreigners because they'd all come from foreign lands. They weren't actually born in, in Israel originally. Um, so the fact that the Samaritan had compassion on him, it was something that was unnatural for his way that he had been brought up. And I don't care how you've been brought up. And the reason that I'm expounded on that is because I don't care how you've been brought up. We should be held to a higher standard because we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. We should do things differently because we know Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Um, this same kind of compassion and and. Thinking about the compassion, where does your compassion come from? Do you know God had compassion on you when he sent his only son to die for our sins? I remember this, and, and I walked into a, uh, it was called a men's advance in Capitan, New Mexico, and a bunch of guys that were team ropers where Kathleen and I were doing ministry had asked me to go with them to this uh, men's advance, and and I'll be honest with you, but Kathleen and I had been going so hard, I really didn't want to go anywhere. But I went with them because they wanted me to, and I sat in the back. Um, some of the guys that were there recognized me uh, as being in the ministry, and they came and got me and brought me to the front because all the pastors were sitting on the front so they could pray for different people. And I realized, um, and, and I'm just going to tell you, this guy I prayed for, he was almost like looking up at that light. That's how big he was. And when I laid hands on him and I, and I prayed with him, I realized I didn't have the compassion that I should have had. It wasn't that I didn't care, but I didn't feel that same compassion. And so uh, I stayed in the building that night, and I went to the altar, and after the, the men had started going out, and I just prayed, God, I want to have that compassion that I first had, that I know that I'm supposed to have. I'm just going to tell you, be careful what you ask for, because uh, I laid on the floor and cried for 45 minutes, and, and uh, they turned the lights out and left me laying on the floor. Um, and that was okay, because it was all about God working with David and bringing me back to that place that I needed to be. Um, and so I've been careful not to lose that compassion because I don't want to lay on the floor and do that again. 
And that's what the Samaritan was moved with. It says he, he saw him and had compassion. Um, so, yeah, I know where I was. I was trying to see what the margin said. I just noticed a note there, but it just gave a different reference. Uh, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds. Pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal. Brought him to an inn. And took care of him. So he didn't just say, hey, I'm, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to bring you along. But it says that he took care of him when he got to the inn. So he didn't just leave him um, for somebody else to take care of. He had that kind of compassion on him. And I realized that... Sometimes, because we live in a world that there's so many people, I, I go back to, and this, this always comes into my mind, um, I worked with a guy when there wasn't anybody begging on the street. By the way, I do remember I forgot about tithes and offerings. So um, tithes and offerings are at the treasure chest um, and you could go anytime you want to. The um, only reason I remembered, my wife gave me money and says, put it in the tithe box, please. Um, we're not supposed to just... And, and what, what I was saying, I, I, we become desensitized. Back before anybody else was standing on the corner, I, I knew a guy... In Fresno, California, he, he got out of work. And he literally, to feed his family, and when he got out of work, he was working on commission. So when he was out of work, he didn't have even unemployment coming in. So he was one of the first guys I ever remember seeing standing on a corner with a sign because his family needed to eat. Well, he told me, he said... Uh, I'll never work again. I've been making $450 a day standing on this corner. Um, so all of a sudden, you know, I'm telling you how I can become desensitized because of what somebody else said. And so we have to be in that position. And I, and I literally do this because uh, traveling the way that I do, I run into these kind of people in every town, on every corner, on almost every overpass um, with the exception of Alabama they have a rule you can't do that there so um, that doesn't happen there uh, at least where you could see it so because of that you can become desensitized so what are you going to do I'm going to say Lord what do you want me to do and how do you want me to do it so I get out of the pickup in uh Atlanta, Georgia the other day, I was at the, the toll tag store there, and uh, I got out of the pickup, and I recognized the guy when he was coming up, because he's hit me up three or four times before, and so I realized that he's just doing that because he's tapping everybody in the, in the whole parking lot on the shoulder, so I got to say again, Lord, what do you want me to do, because I don't want to be moved by the last time. I want to be moved by what the Holy Spirit tells me to do today. And I think that's something we've got to do. I think that's something that, um, and I'm not telling you to give your money or, or anything else. I'm just, I'm telling you to listen to the Lord and see what he says. Because, again, we can become desensitized. This Samaritan had the best chance in the world to not care. Here's a guy that probably would ridicule him on, on any other day because of who he was and and where he worshipped. But instead, he wasn't moved by that. He was moved by the compassion uh, that was, was inside him from God. So he went to him, oh, no, verse 35. And on the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. 
So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, let's see, who was he talking to? He was talking to the lawyer, the rich man. And, the, and he said, he who showed mercy on him, and Jesus told him, said, go and do likewise. Now what set this whole thing up was, was just before that, uh, this rich man had come to him and he said, uh, uh, well, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, it's written in the law, what is your reading of it? So he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have said rightly. So that, then Jesus went on and, and told this parable. So how do we do that? I'm not just talking about people that are standing on the corner and stuff. I'm talking about other people that are in need. And, and Jesus went on in this chapter, the next thing he said, uh, verse 38, Now it happened as they went, he entered a certain village. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And, he, and she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted from much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, are you worried and troubled about so many things? But one thing is it need is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. And what was that good part? That good part was listening to him. And coming into that place that we we listen to what God has to say and and how he has to say it. Well, how does that translate into our days? Um, what gas station do you go to? QT. What grocery store do you go to? You know, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm wanting you all to think. Um, and so Rhonda says QT, I'm going to tell you how many people there are at QT that are in need. A lot of them. They need to know our Jesus. They may have healing they need in their body. They may have, and, and so if we're sensitive and we listen to the Holy Spirit, um, I've been standing in, in, a, in a gas station. I've got nothing on my car, nothing on my shirt or my uh, anything that projects that I'm who I am. And somebody will say, could you pray with me? And I have no idea why that happens other than the fact that if we're full of compassion that God has for us, then we're going to project that kind of love towards other people. They're going to see that in us. I remember one time I was reached into a, I, I was, I did have my uh, chariots of light colors on and, and, and I'd rode to, I was riding to Cottonwood Cowboy Church when Kathleen and I had that church in Northern California and it was hot. I reached into a, a place to get a tea out of the, the ice box and this lady backed up because it happened, she didn't read the colors. She just saw motorcycle colors. And then uh, I went outside, and I was sitting there drinking the tea, and she came out, and she said, are you a Christian? I said, I am. She says, uh, I got something going on in my life that I really like to uh, 
like to talk to somebody about, and, she, and I don't even remember what it was. It's been, you know, maybe 18 years ago. Uh, but what stood out was she was in need, and she was ready to talk. And we need to make ourselves available in that kind of place. And that's why I really moved on this, uh, the Good Samaritan, because that guy was in need. And he was truly in need. And he came and he was a part of what he was doing. Not only a part, but he put him on his own animal. He took care of him. He did all of those things. And why did he do it? Just because he was a lover of God. And he listened. And he cared. And the priest and the Levite were supposed to be lovers of God also. Now, I'm not going to judge them. Whatever they, for whatever reason they didn't do it, um, they didn't do it. I'm pretty sure the Samaritan was in a hurry to get to where he was going too. But yet he took the time to go ahead and do this. And so do we realize you've got a Jesus inside of you that everybody needs. And if we realize that the only way that I can project Jesus is by caring. That may be the best place that, that we can do that. You know, um, even though I'm a preacher, even though I do what I'm doing, it's a little out of my comfort zone what I did at the table with that, uh, that uh, waiter the other day. And, but... It got more in my comfort zone because in those days there was 541 people that accepted Jesus at that rally because of those of us that had spread around and were doing that. And that was just the ones that we did. There were, there were I saw uh, three other Christian clubs walking around and I know they were doing the same thing. And so what we've got to do is realize that sometimes I'm pretty sure this Samaritan was out of his comfort zone. But he decided to get out of his comfort zone and do what was right. And sometimes if we'll do that and realize, you know, well, I'm busy. I got this to do and I got that to do and I got to be here and I got to be there. And I got this job to do and, and this guy's been t uh, talking to me and, and telling me you got to hurry up and do this. And, and sometimes we just really need to listen to the Holy Spirit and let the other busyness take care of itself. And if we do that, then what will happen is more people will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because we took the time to care. I'm pretty sure that even though the Bible doesn't say it, I'm pretty sure that, and this may have been just a parable, it may have been the truth. And, and if it was the truth, I'm pretty sure that that Jew, when he got up out of that bed in that inn, he had a whole lot different thought towards Samaritans than he had before. Why? Because he cared. Because he waited for him. People will have a whole lot different thought towards Jesus Christ when I show that I care instead of just, that's who I am, I'm a Christian. Why am I a Christian? I'm a Christian because God loved me so much that he sent his only son to die that I might have life. And, and because he did, he wants me to have that same kind of compassion. He's not asking me to lay down my life. Um, I was reminded as I was preparing for this, something that happened to uh, James, our overseer in Nigeria, and it's been... Uh, eight years ago now, but uh, one of the pastors from over there had texted me that morning and said to pray Boko Haram. And, uh, that, and I had no idea what all that meant. So I started trying to call James and I couldn't get him. Well, it turned out he finally called me at 8 o'clock that night on Texas time, which would have been uh, probably 1 or 2 in the morning there. And uh, he was laying in some bushes, and he said, Boko Haram, let me go. 
But the story that he told me, the the account that he told me the next day, uh, made me realize, number one, how blessed we are, and number two, how it could be if we don't dominate our country as Christians. Um, Boko Haram, who in Nigeria is... uh, Uh, whatever that group was that was uh, supposed to have been annihilated. ISIS. ISIS, yeah. Uh, No, not ISIS. Say that again. No, it wasn't Al-Qaeda. It was the other, it was the more radical ones. Anyway, um, they're radical too, but uh, the Boko Haram had taken... 16 people off of this bus that day. And James says, uh, they ask one question. They had them all on their knees. And they asked one question. Are you a Christian or a Muslim? And the first guy said, I'm a Christian. He, they said, denounce Jesus. He said, no. And they shot him in the head. And they got to the second guy, or the second woman. And uh, they asked her the same question. And she said, I won't denounce Jesus. They shot him in the head, shot her in the head. Uh, third guy, same thing. Well, the fourth one kneeling there was James. And uh, they had taken their shoes. They had taken their telephones. They'd taken their money. Um, and he had uh, uh, $1,650 of my money that day uh, because he was going to take care of business uh, for uh, for the ministry in, in Abuja, which is the capital. But they left him with some papers, and they read the papers, and, and it was actually um, our incorporation in, his, in uh, Nigeria for uh, David Simmons Worldwide Ministry. And uh, they asked, says, who's this Dr. David Simmons? And he said, is he a preacher? Yes. But he's done a lot of things for our people. He's drilled wells. He's done this. He's done that. They handed him back the papers and said, uh, because of him, you'll live. And they went, moved on to the next guy. And, and they, they didn't give him his shoes back. They gave him his passport and his telephone. And they didn't give him his money back. Uh, he did ask them. The reason I shared that is because what we have to realize is we have a covenant with God. And in that covenant with God, what do we do with that covenant? Do we live that covenant or do we just take the benefits from the covenant? And when we live that covenant, we get the benefits. But the whole idea is I want to live for God. I want to do what the Lord tells us to do, like the Good Samaritan, that kind of thing, as well as just walk daily by that. And I believe that if we live in the compassion that God has given us, that we will move the right direction in everything we can do. James told me later, he says, I knew they were fixing, that, 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 that this was it. I was done. They were, because I'm not going to denounce, denounce Jesus. Um, God made a way. And... and did that mean he didn't make a way for the other people? You, you know what? I'm having a blast in life. I love life. But I'm not afraid to go because I know where I'm going to be. And I have no idea how great it's going to be. Um, but again, I'm having a blast in life right now. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry. Um, I actually quit traveling with a guy that had a, a martyr uh, syndrome. He, 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 he told me one time, I'm praying that I'll be martyred someday. Um, he's not in the ministry anymore, and I still am. Um, but uh, we have to get in a position that we just listen to God and let God lead us and guide us in that place. Um, and I'm not telling you it's easy. Sometimes it's, it takes a dedication because this world is so busy and Things are going on so much. And if you listen to the news too much, you can get that bad attitude too. Um, and uh, 
uh, my, my wife leaves the room, so I'll turn the news off. Um, and that usually is the way that I get the news off in that place. But we get, what, 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 how are you going to feed yourself? Are you going to feed yourself on the goodness of God or the badness of the world? And we get in that place that we realize that we can, we can be who God wants us to be. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you give us to live in a country that we have the freedoms that we have. Father, protect the men and women around this world that are protecting our right just to worship you. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your son. And Father, may we always listen close that we might be who you want us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Remember, Jesus loves you and so do we. I hope you've listened to the word uh, during this service so that you can have your life changed. You're, you'll see how the DNA of your entire life is about to change. Also, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never made him the Lord of your life, Paul says this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's very simple to do that. All I have to really do is say, Jesus is the Lord of my life, and I believe that God raised him from the dead. That's exactly what Paul said. Many times we have people pray a prayer uh, so that we know that we've drawn a line in the sand and we've let everybody know that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So I want to do that with you right now so that you can literally say, today is the day, and whatever time it is, wherever you're at watching, you'll know that you've had a change in your life. So say this with me. You can bow your head and close your eyes, or you can keep your eyes open. Uh, and uh, I, I always love what uh, Oop Schroner who is a prophet of God, said, he said, if you're drowning in a swimming pool at the Holiday Inn, you wouldn't want anybody to close their eyes. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're literally drowning in a swimming pool of sin someplace. So say this with me. Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for me. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me of them. And Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. And I commit today that I will live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, if you just did that, then what you just did is you invited Jesus Christ to live in your life, to be the Lord of your life, and you're going to see a complete change in every area of your entire life right now. If you've watched this broadcast, you also know that uh, what we've talked about at different times uh, through different broadcasts is, is finances. If we, the Bible tells us in Luke 6, 38, that if we give, that he'll give back to us, pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more. Then it says, uh, right after that, and this is Luke 6, 38, then it says, whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. So if you become a covenant partner with us today, there's many things that we do for outreaches here out of this church and out of the ministry, not only here in Weatherford, Texas, but all over the country and all over the world. We uh, have rodeo events right here in the arena where we have, uh, he paid your fees simply means that nobody pays to, to enter. They come, we have a devotional, it becomes an outreach opportunity. And we do that in rodeo arenas, horse show arenas, and roping arenas all over the United States. 
We drill wells and have uh, crusades in Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And by doing each one of those, uh, you become, and becoming a covenant partner with this ministry, you become a part of those outreaches. You take part in the reward in the end time, as well as you get back pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more because you're a covenant partner, and this is good ground. Bible tells us in another place he gives back. Uh, this is in uh, Mark, the 10th chapter. It tells us that he gives back to us some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Well, this ground has been worked. It has is, is been fertilized. And, and I would expect a 100 fold return on that. So there's a uh, website that you've seen. Do two things. One, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let us know at that website address. And we'll send you some information so that you'll be able to walk that walk and succeed in life in your new Christian life. Also, if you give, there's a donate button right there. If you press that donate button and give, that seed gets planted into good ground and it comes back to you pressed down, shaken together and running over. Kathleen and I pray every day over every partner of this ministry. So I want to make sure that we're able to pray for you and, and let us know the things that you may have need of in life so that we can bring them before the Father. Have a great day. Remember, Jesus loves you, we love you, and Jesus is Lord.